Hi you five, Miss Asha here. Um, I'm with you today to read to you. Uh, you're going to get to chill out for a moment while you listen to some of our new class readers. So, this is our new book, okay? Uh, we were going to do Hugo Cabret, but as some of you might know, there's very little um, words in it. So we wanted something that we could actually sit and read to you, okay? So, I've chosen The Boy Who Sailed the Ocean in an Armchair which is one of my favourites. I really love it. So I really hope that you do too. There's going to be a task to go with this one today, okay? Uh, usually, I think the task will be separate, be on something else. But just for today, you're going to have a task to do on the front cover and the blurb. You're going to make a prediction, okay? So if you're listening to this video and you haven't done that task yet, pause and go and have a look at the reading task first. Okay. Chapter one. My name's Beckett Rumsey, and there are lots of important people in my life who I talk to every day. For starters, my seven-year-old bug-collecting brother Billy is one of them, although he talks nonsense 99% of the time. And the other 1%? Utter nonsense. Dad, who delivers fish from the Codfather van, is another. Mainly he talks about haddock, but I can live with that. Ibiza Nana, she's my grandma, and she always rings for a chat from Spain. And then there's Pearl, Dad's girlfriend. I talk to her a lot, and Pearl's good at listening. Plus, she gives great hugs and tells us that she loves us to the moon and back, which is at least 768,800 kilometres of love. I know this because Billy made me check. In fact, Pearl's almost a mum to Billy and me. I say almost because the one important person in my life who I don't get to talk to at all is my real mum. My mum died when I was four. Not being able to talk to her is the hardest thing. Harder than trying to pat your head and rub your stomach at the same time. I don't remember a lot about when Mum died, but I know when she went off to hospital to have Billy and she never came back. And I never said goodbye to her. OK, being totally truthful, at the time I didn't think saying goodbye was all that important. I mean, you're four and it's just a word like farm or zoo or dog. But now, at this very moment, I'm thinking goodbye is the most important word of all. You see, it's 11.30 on the Monday night at the beginning of half term and I'm sitting in my dad's fish van outside a hairdressing salon called Crops and Bobbers. Dad's telling Billy and me that we've left our house at Honeydown Hills for good and we're moving into the flat above the hairdressers, just the three of us. We're not to worry about leaving Pearl behind and no, we don't need to worry about saying goodbye to her. She'll understand. No, we're not to ring her. At first, I'm confused with a capital Z. So confused I can't even spell. That's how confused I am not say goodbye to someone so important for the second time in my life. Not say goodbye to Pearl. Dad's having a laugh. Only Dad isn't having a laugh. His face is harder than dried up breakfast cereal left in a bowl. If I could drive, I'd go straight back to our house and Pearl and tell her that Dad's lost his marbles. In fact, that his marbles are so lost they're probably floating around in a galaxy far, far away. Pearl would welcome us back and say it doesn't matter that we didn't say goodbye because this isn't goodbye at all. Is hello. She'd bring us straight inside and let us play with her tubes of paint because Pearl's an artist. She'd say she loved us all the way to the moon and back again and give us the biggest hug and we'd say we didn't actually go to the moon just to Eden but we're so glad to be back again. When I tell dad we should go back to Pearl his mouth drops into an easy O. Oh. You, he mutters, scratching the koi carp tattoo on his arm, are not going back to say goodbye or anything else. You do not need to say it. Well, my dad is a prawn short of a prawn cocktail. Plus, there is the little matter of us being at our new flat already and it being the middle of the night. I can't be travelling all over the place at this time with two children, Dad says, forgetting that he's just done exactly that. Because about an hour ago, he woke us up, threw all of our stuff into boxes and strapped Mum's favourite armchair onto the top of the van beside the plastic one-eyed cod. When we asked Dad where Pearl was, he said she'd gone out and then he shooed us into the van and we zoomed away as if we were in the Grand Prix. Although I don't think a van with a giant cod on the roof could enter. Anyway, this is our new life now. We're going to be living by the seaside and this is our home. Dad points up at the flat as if he's the wise man from the east pointing at a star. Living by the seaside? Our new life? I blink back my confusion. What was wrong with the old life? You can't just throw away old things like that. Otherwise we'd have slung out Ibiza Nana a long time ago. OK, so saying goodbye doesn't seem all that important to Dad, but he's nuts if he thinks it's not important to me. Well, I'm going to do something about this. In fact, I'm not going to say goodbye to Pearl at all. 
What I'm going to do is contact her and bring her here to live with us. Yes, that's what I'll do. But now I'm thinking about goodbyes and it reminds me of Mum and suddenly saying goodbye to her is what I want more than anything. So the other thing I'm going to do is say goodbye to Mum because I can't bring her here to live with us, no matter how much I wish I could. OK, Dad, you're the boss, I say, saluting. This is what I call the bluff. Pretend to Dad that I agree with whatever he says, when really I don't agree with any of it and I'm going to do something about it. By the way, Dad isn't the boss in our house at all. That was Pearl. Not that I'm saying she went about being all bossy boots to everyone, but she liked things done her way. Like even though it was our house that she moved into, she wanted to decorate it in her style. Pearl was very stylish though, so it was okay. She wore her hair in a bun secured with a paintbrush and these long floaty velvet coats that swished on the floor. And when she wanted you to do something, she'd smile and you'd want to do it for her because she was so lovely. In the end, everyone wanted to do what Pearl asked. So you see, Dad isn't the boss at all and that's why I'm going to be the boss on this. Take control of the situation and bring Pearl back to us. Yes, Beckett Rumsey, says Dad, running his hand over his bald head. You know Dad means business when he starts using my full name. You're quite correct. On this, I am the boss. What I say goes. Yes, Stephen Rumsey, I reply, thinking that Dad has had a funny turn. To be honest, Dad's had a funny few turns recently, so I shouldn't really be surprised. For the past two weeks, he's been extra quiet. Plus, he'd leave for work early and get home late. Pearl said she didn't believe he had to work so hard. She got angry about it. Dad would laugh and say she was giving him a haddock. That was him joking about. Pearl didn't like it. She'd say fish aren't funny. Obviously, she doesn't know the joke about the fight at the seafood restaurant where four fish get battered. Fish are a bit funny. In the end, Dad didn't bring fish home for our tea anymore and he didn't talk about them so much. Anyway, what I'm trying to say is, looking back on it, Dad hasn't been Dad for the last few weeks. In fact, looking at him now, standing in front of our new flat, I'm not sure who Dad really is. OK, so we're here, a few minutes away from the ocean and standing in front of a blue blistered door to the right-hand side of Crops and Bobber's hairdressing salon. Dad said, this is it, and checks out my watermelon slice wide super smile. I think he's impressed that I'm so happy with all these changes. What he doesn't realise is this. This is the smile of a boy who's going to sort out everything. It's the smile of a boy who thinks his dad has gone completely bananas and the only thing left to do is pretend to be as bananas as him. Billy pipes up that this flat isn't really our new home, so it must be my birthday present. He lifts his finger and makes a home for it inside his nose before jiggling it around like beads in a kaleidoscope. Sweet baby cheeses. My entire family is bananas now. As if. Dad's not going to buy me a flat. I mean, I was just hoping for a life-size skeleton on my birthday, like any 11-year-old boy. Though imagine if the flat was my new den, like Billy says. A place where I could store all my medical encyclopedias. Imagine if Dad was investing in the future, knowing I'll need a special place where I can work in peace to find a medical cure for the heebie-jeebies. OK, this is ridiculous. I'm going as bananas as them. Why do you think I'd buy Beckett a flat, asks Dad, his eyes ping-ponging from Billy to me. Anyway, it's not your birthday until next Monday. Dad says it like I don't have a clue when my own birthday is. What parent will buy their child a flat as a gift anyway, continues Dad, ushering us closer to the blistered door. A rich one? I reply. Pfft, says Dad. There's no money in fish. He points at a name on the buzzer. Come here, Beckett. Look at this. I haven't got my glasses on. What does that say? Is it cat wom? Dad runs his finger over the illuminated button. Holy smokes. It is, I exclaim. Are we going to be living next door to Catwoman? I can't believe it. At that point, Dad pushes the button and even though he takes his finger off sharpish, it keeps buzzing. The lady who opens the door looks nothing like Catwoman. For starters, she isn't wearing cat's ears or a funny mask. Although, to be fair, I might have actually wet my pants if she had been. Cat looks us up and down and then up again as if she's watching some vertical tennis match. Billy tries to hide behind my leg as Cat gives Dad the key to our new flat and then asks us to follow her inside. Once up the staircase, Cat points to flat A. That's me. And then flat B. That's you. I own the hairdressing salon below. Come in for a cut at any time. She looks at Dad's bald head. Maybe not. Meanwhile, Billy is muttering over and over, I think we should go home now. Wise words from young Billy, quickly ignored by old Daddy. I feel Billy's cold little hand slip into mine and he gives me a squeeze. OK, so it feels like he's milking a cow, but I know it's his secret way of asking me if everything will be OK. Call it a sort of code, if you will. 
like the Enigma code I learned about at school, only a billion times less complicated. This way we can speak to each other without actually moving our lips. It started a long time ago when Billy came home from the hospital and he gripped my hand and I'd squeeze his. This time, even though I squeeze Billy's hand back, I don't actually believe everything is okay. Billy whispers, why have we run away from home? Why isn't Pearl here? This is very much a mystery and we have to solve it. I know, I mumble back, exactly what I was thinking. Billy squeezes my hand again, but more urgently this time. I squeeze his hand back. Then I remember that he'd picked his nose. Okay, that's chapter one. Uh, I think the idea is that we'll be trying to do a chapter of this a day, okay, for you to enjoy whilst you're at home. So I hope you enjoyed that. I really enjoyed reading it to you. I will see you tomorrow for the next instalment. Thanks, guys. Bye.